Well, Happy New Year, New Day Church. Even though the snow has prevented us from being together in person, at least most of us, I am so thankful for the technology that's allowing us to gather together virtually. I'm just so thankful. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. And uh, technology is helping us to be faithful to that command, despite what the capricious New England clement weather uh, might decide to do on any given Sunday. So a big welcome to everyone who's participating today. Thanks to everyone who's joining us online. I want to say a special welcome to Tammy67. Yes, I see that you're joining us online right now. I'm so glad that you're with us and I'm so glad that everyone else here uh, is with us too. For those who are new, uh, Tammy67 and others, uh, let me explain right at the outset that right now as a church, we're studying through the gospel of Matthew. And uh, we've been just taking uh, Matthew's gospel one section at a time, and that's brought us to the particular section that we're covering today, which is Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46, where Jesus shares with us the parable of the wicked tenants. Now, I must confess that this particular parable was of special interest to me because I have a bunch of family in real estate. My parents are in real estate. My brother's in real estate. My uncle uh, dabbles in real estate as well. And so this one was of particular interest to me. Now, Speaking of real estate, there is a side to it uh, that's appealing to me. And that, of course, would be the, the financial side of it is appealing to me. And while I was thinking about doing that, the story is this. Back in 2008, when we first started the church, um, I knew the church wouldn't be able to pay me uh, for a certain amount of time. And I thought, well, the way that I'll provide for my family uh, between now and when the church could actually start paying me, uh, for those who don't know, we're a startup. We just began from nothing in 2008. And so I said, well, during the time where the church can't pay me, uh, I'll make an income through real estate. And that was the initial plan. But here's the deal. The more I learned about real estate, the less interested I was in buying rental property. And the main reason for that was the horror stories uh, that I heard one after another after another um, about people who had tenants from hell. And I just was like, no, I'm cured of wanting to do this. I mean, family members and others in the church told me the stories. This is so disgusting, but uh, some people have told me that their tenants have let their animals just use the bathroom whenever and wherever they want in the house. And they've told me that this has piled up for months or even years. And then of course, when they move out, that's left for the landlord to deal with. Other stories are of tenants moving out who trash the place on the way out, breaking windows, maybe spitefully putting staples uh, along the wood frames of the windows, maybe even spray painting the cabinets. Some tenants are hoarders, and I've heard the story of some who moved out, left all their junk behind because it was uh, so uh, prodigious uh, in scope that they weren't able to take it themselves, even though they were hoarders and, and likely wanted to. And so the landlord had to rent a, a dumpster and just take out five loads of dumpsters, and even at that point, they were just starting to make headway. Uh, some tenants get in and they just stop paying. I read an a article online uh, not too long ago uh, that told the story of a tenant in California, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, she rented a $3.5 million Airbnb that overlooked Los Angeles and had agreed to pay for six months. But 570 plus days later, she was still there and still uh, allegedly hadn't paid a dime uh, to be there. And oh my goodness, the stories go on. The times where people uh, end up having to you bring their tenants into court and it's a lengthy legal battle and all that kind of stuff. And long story short, after hearing all these stories, I was like, I'm out. Absolutely no way. No thank you. For me, no amount of money would make it worth it to have to deal with problems like these. Now, apparently, this is so common that there's actually a number of TV shows that are dedicated to telling the story of bad tenants. 
For example, on Spike TV, you have the world's worst tenants where they reenact actual confrontations between eviction specialists and terrible tenants. There's a British reality TV show called Nightmare Tenants, which chronicles landlords dealing with tenants who are hoarders, squatters, party animals, and property wreckers. And long story short, and and finally, uh, many of the cases on Judge Judy, uh, you see Judge Judy arbitrating disputes between landlord and tenant. Well, Solomon was right when he stated that there's nothing new under the sun because guess what? These same problems between landlords and tenants existed during the time of Christ. These problems were so common and so well understood by the average Jew of Christ's day That when Jesus needed to teach an important spiritual truth to the people, he chose a word picture that everyone could relate to and easily understand. He chose a story of a problem between a landlord and his tenants. A story we call the parable of the wicked tenant. And this is what we're going to see in our text today. Jesus telling this story of Uh, tenants who were wicked and gave their landlord so much trouble. Here's where we're going today in case you want an overview. The first thing we're going to do is look at the story. The second thing we're going to do is look at the symbols. And then the third and final thing we'll do is look at the significance of the story for us. Let's dive in beginning with number one, the story, the story. And we see this in verses 33 to 39, where Jesus said, There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and then went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's get him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So friends, that is the story. And that leads us very nicely to the second thing we're going to look at today. And we'll call this the symbols, the symbols. This story that Jesus originally told to the religious leaders in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, only a couple days before his crucifixion, is filled with symbolism. And understanding all the symbolism in the story is the key, not only to understanding the story, but it's also the key to understanding the significance of the story for us. So let me unpack the symbolism. I got five things to share with you. Here's the first. Number one, the landowner represents God the Father. In Jesus' parable, the master of the house was the landowner. And the landowner represents God the Father because he is the one who owns all the land in all the earth by virtue of the fact that he was the one who created it. As we read in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. So again, the landowner is God the Father. Okay, number two. Whereas the landowner represents God the Father, secondly, the vineyard represents the nation of Israel. Here's something you may not know. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is commonly pictured as God's vineyard. For example, the psalmist Asaph wrote this, You, God, brought us, the nation of Israel, from Egypt like a grapevine. You drove away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. You cleared the ground for us and we took root and filled the land. The idea is we filled, you, we filled the land like grapes would fill a vineyard. 
In other words, God, you planted us and we became your fruitful vineyard. So God's vineyard is the nation of Israel. And this is made even more clear if you want a uh, supplemental verse. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7, it explicitly states the nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, in mentioning that the landowner built a wall, a wine press, and a watchtower, Jesus is simply letting us know that the landowner didn't merely plant his vineyard. He additionally took all the necessary steps so that he could ensure a vineyard that was healthy and a vineyard that produced, uh, produced lots of fruit. You see, for a successful vineyard, it needs a wall to keep out the animals. It needs a watchtower to keep out both people and wildfires. And of course, it needs a wine press so that you can take the grapes and turn it into delicious wine. And the landowner in Jesus' story made sure that his vineyard had everything needed in order for it to produce a beautiful crop of grapes. And this parallels what God the Father had done for his vineyard, which was the nation of Israel. He didn't just plant Israel in the land. He did everything he could possibly do to ensure that they would be spiritually fruitful, serving the purpose for which he created them, which was to share the good news of salvation with the rest of the world. You see, God cleared out the rocks of the pagan inhabitants of the land, and he surrounded the nation with his protection. So they lacked nothing that would prevent them from being spiritually fruitful. All that was left to do now was for Israel to do the work that God had assigned her to do. Moving right along, whereas the vineyard represents the nation of Israel, thirdly we see the tenants represent the religious leaders of Israel. Just as the master of the house leased his vineyard to tenants, so God the Father leased the nation of Israel to the religious leaders. That is, God put them in charge of the nation of Israel in the same way that the master of the house put tenants in charge of his vineyard. Now we know that the tenants represent the religious leaders specifically because of verse 45. Take a look. Verse 45 reads, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, because this was one of three, so when they heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. So this was no mystery who represented who in the story. When the religious leaders heard Jesus tell the story and heard Jesus talk about the tenants, they rightly perceived that Jesus was speaking about them. So they knew that they were the wicked tenants in Jesus' story. Moving on, whereas the tenants represent the religious leaders of Israel, fourthly we see that the servants represent the prophets. In Jesus' story, the master of the house sent his servants to let the tenants know that he required his fruit. And in the same way, God the Father, the master of the house of Israel, sent his servants, the prophets, to let the nation of Israel know that he also required fruit. As I mentioned earlier, God had created the nation of Israel so that they would be a light for the Gentiles, bringing his salvation to the ends of the earth. But here's the deal. They were not serving their purpose. So God sent the prophets to rebuke them for their sin and to call them back to the purpose for which God had created them. But just as the tenants in the story killed the master's servants, so the tenants of God's vineyard, the religious leaders of Israel, killed God's prophets. In the story, the tenants beat and stoned and killed the servants the master of the house had sent. And this is exactly what the religious leaders of Israel did with God's prophets. For example... When the leaders of Israel didn't like what the prophet Jeremiah was telling them, Jeremiah was arrested. He was whipped and put in stocks. Likewise, when the leaders of Israel didn't like what the prophet Zechariah was telling them, Zechariah was stoned in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. 
And when the leaders of Israel didn't like what the prophet Uriah was telling them, they sent someone to kill him. Now, fortunately, he heard about it and escaped to Egypt, but unfortunately for him, men were sent to capture him and bring him back to Israel where Uriah was killed with a sword and buried in an unmarked grave. So you see, just as the servants of the master of the house were beaten, stoned, and killed, so was the case for God's prophets. As the author of Hebrews puts it, God's prophets, they were tortured, jeered at, meaning made fun of. Their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, like Isaiah. And others were killed with the sword. And friends, this is why Jesus lamented over Jerusalem, saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. So just as clearly as we saw that the landowner was God, that the vineyard was Israel, and that the tenants were the religious leaders, so now we see that the servants represent God's prophets. All right, we're now at the last character in the story, the son. And whereas the servants represent the prophets, fifthly and finally, the son represents Jesus, who is the son of God. In Jesus' parable, the tenants are hell-bent on refusing to give the master of the house the fruit that he required. Therefore, They treat the master's son the exact same way that they treated the master's servants. Jesus tells them, tells us, they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And this, of course, foreshadows Jesus' imminent death on the cross, which will take place only a couple days from when Jesus told this story. Now, maybe like me, At this point in the story, maybe like me when I was studying and preparing this message, maybe at this point in the story, you're confused. Maybe right now you're asking yourself, why in the world did the master of the house send his son to those wicked tenants when he had the history of what those people did to his servants? Wasn't the master foolish? Wasn't he kind of an imbecile? knowing how these tenants treated his servants, to then go ahead and send his son? What in the world is up with that? Well, friends, here's what we need to understand. This was one of the aha moments as I prepared this sermon, and hopefully it will be for you as well. Here's what we got to know. Jesus is telling us a story that illustrates the way a compassionate and loving God acts towards sinners... Not the way a businessman would act to protect his investment. So now we understand why the master sent servant after servant followed by his son. It's because the master represents God who desires that none of us should perish, but that all of us might come to repentance and be saved. All right, so far we've covered... Number one, the story. Number two, the symbols. And we just finished covering all the symbolism contained in the story. And now that we've covered the story and the symbols, now we need to get into, thirdly, the significance of this story for our lives as well. Now, the key to understanding the significance of any passage for us is to first understand what it meant to the original audience that the passage was shared with. So let's do that, and then we'll switch gears and talk about the significance for us. Jesus had a point in sharing this story with the religious leaders. Jesus wanted them to know, as well as the huge crowd that was gathered there in the temple courts, listening to Jesus' exchange with the religious leaders. Jesus had a message for them, and it was this. Jesus, through this story, was letting the religious leaders and the people both know that judgment, meaning eternal judgment, would fall on anyone who failed to provide God with the fruit of that he required. 
That this was the significance of the passage is made abundantly clear by what comes next in our text. Jesus asks the religious leaders, When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what do you think he'll do to those wicked tenants? And they, the religious leaders, responded back to Jesus, well, he's going to put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Now, as we've covered, the master of the house represents God the Father. And him putting the tenants to a miserable death speaks to God's fierce judgment that would fall on everyone there who was failing to provide God with the fruit that he required. Jesus was telling them, hey, if you don't serve the purpose that God has for you on this earth, then two things will happen to you. Number one, God will judge you for your disobedience. He'll judge you for refusing to do what he has commanded. And then secondly, he will replace you with others who will do his will. Now, this is incredible because, friends, is this not exactly what's happened to the nation of Israel? Because they rejected God, by rejecting God's Son, God, in turn, rejected them and replaced them with the church. I hope you understand that God's original plan was to have the nation of Israel be the means by which His message of salvation would go out to the world. But when Israel rejected God's will and just refused to do it, God rejected them and replaced them with the church, with you and with me and with every other follower of Jesus on the earth. That judgment and rejection are what Jesus is focusing on in terms of the significance of the story for his listeners, is made clear by the fact that Jesus states it twice. He's just stated it once through the story, and now he states it again directly from Scripture. Take a look. Jesus says to them, Have you guys never read in the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Here, Jesus quotes Psalm 118, where the stone that was rejected represents Jesus. So listen, in Psalm, in the story, we learn of a rejected son. And in the scripture, Psalm 118, we learn of a rejected stone. But both the son and the stone represent Jesus who was rejected by the religious leaders and by the nation of Israel at large. And once again, the result is twofold, rejection and judgment. As Jesus put it, therefore, because of your rejection of God's plan for your life, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Friends, there's the rejection. Jesus continues, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And friends, there's the judgment. Jesus is saying, all who reject God's will for their life can expect judgment in the life to come and here and now can expect to be replaced by others who will serve God's purpose on the earth. This is the message Jesus was sharing with the religious leaders. Now, here's the last verse in our passage, verse 45. Take a look. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables... They perceived, this is key, don't miss it. They perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Now, by way of application today, let me ask you this. Is anyone here as perceptive as the religious leaders? Understanding that Jesus wasn't only speaking to them, but is also speaking through this parable to us. 
When the religious leaders heard the story, though they were wicked, at least they were perceptive enough to understand, Jesus is speaking to me. And I want to ask, are we perceptive enough to understand that Jesus is also speaking to us? Though in its historical context, this story was originally shared with a different group of people understand that God the Father saw to it that this story would be preserved so that Jesus' message to them could become Jesus' message to us. Friends, when Israel rejected God, rejected God's Son, and rejected the assignment that God had for them here on this earth, which was spreading the good news of salvation around the world. God rejected them and replaced them with the church. Now one day, as Paul tells us in Romans 11, Israel will return and will bear fruit for his kingdom. But in the meanwhile, God has chosen the church to do the job that he originally intended the nation of Israel to do. And when I say the church, hey, that's just the name given to the collective number of disciples of Jesus around the world. So when we say that it's the job of the church to spread the news of salvation around the world, that means it's your job and mine. God's job description for the nation of Israel has simply become our job description. Let me read it to you. Isaiah 49, verse 6. This was the job description for the nation of Israel. Israel, I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. But now this same job description has become the job description of the church. Church, I will now make you, since Israel rejected me, I will now make you a light for the nations. For what purpose? Same purpose as was the case with Israel, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Friends, it's the exact same job description. It's just now given to us. So let us learn a lesson from Israel's mistakes. We are here on this earth for one purpose and in one purpose only, and it's to spread the glorious news about Christ with the world. And if we, like the nation of Israel, should fail to serve our purpose, then like them, we should expect two things. One, God's judgment for our disobedience, and two, God's rejection of us. If God replaced Israel with us because they wouldn't do what he asked, how in the world can we think that God will do any less for us? So friends, if we should choose to disobey like they did, then we too can expect the same thing they got. Judgment and rejection. Now, if you're a true disciple of Jesus, then you're going to go out of your way to obey God's command to use your life to point others to Jesus. You're going to do what you can. This makes me think of just a couple days ago. I was at Costco grabbing a couple things. And while there, I noticed these huge round sleds. And they were so big, I thought, man, all five of my kids could probably fit on this sled. I've never seen one so big. So I took it down from the shelf and I started kind of looking at it from all sides. I was checking the price tag and all this. And while I was doing that, another uh, elderly man who was in the aisle with me uh, just said, oh, are, are we getting snow or something that you're looking at these sleds? And I said, yeah, we are. And sensing an opportunity, I threw in. And I'm upset about it because I'm a pastor. And this Sunday, we have church. And the projection is that the snow is going to arrive on the same day we have church. So, man, I just, why can't it snow any of these other days of the week? Why does it have to be on Sunday? Now, sometime I throw out that hook and nobody bites. Uh, This man asked the follow-up question I was hoping for, which is, oh, you're a pastor of a church? Uh, What church do you pastor? And that kind of opened the door. I got to tell him a little bit about the church. Can you believe we started in 2008 with eight people and now it's grown to nearly 2,000 people? Isn't that unbelievable? And we just got chatting. And he kind of shared some views that he had about Jesus and I did my best to try to steer him in the right direction. But since I knew this conversation wasn't going to go on for 40 minutes like one of my sermons... I said, you know what? Bottom line is this. 
There's so many different things that we could uh, get lost in. There's so many details that we could get lost in. But let me kind of bring it all down to its core essence. Here's the thing that's most important to understand. There's peace with God through faith in Christ. We said a couple more words and the conversation very naturally came to a close. I said, it's great running into you. Great to see you. He said the same to me and we went on our ways. Now, maybe you're saying, Mike, I know you're a busy guy. You're stopping and having these kinds of conversations when you're out and about and this and that. What's up with that? Well, here's the deal. Yeah, I am a busy guy, but not too busy to try to show God Almighty that I understand the reason that I'm here on earth. And it's to use my life as a signpost to point others to the salvation that can only be found in Christ. You know, you know what I was doing there more than just sharing my faith? You know what I was doing there? I was trying to show God the evidence that my faith is genuine. I was trying to show God I'm the real deal. I'm not a professing disciple of Jesus. Like in word only, I profess to be a disciple of Jesus and I say that with my words, but I also back it up with my lifestyle. You see, I know that God is looking for the fruit that he requires from my life. And I don't want to assume that, oh no, everything's good with me and God. I'm ignoring what he says. I'm not listening to what he requires, but oh, of course I'm going to go to heaven. I don't view things that way. I know what God requires. And I want to show him every chance I get the genuineness of my faith. And friends, this is what every single one of us who are truly disciples of Jesus ought to be doing as well. Looking for opportunities all throughout the week to show God, God, we're the real deal. I'm a tenant who's going to give you the fruit you require in its season. And friends, the season we're living in right now, it's the church age where a huge harvest of souls are to be reaped for God. That's why we're here. God could have just taken us up to heaven the moment we got saved, but he didn't. He left us here and it's for a reason. It's so that we can point others to the same salvation that we've found through Christ. Now, I realize that this is an intense message to kick off the new year with. But please understand, as your pastor, it is my job before God, which I take very seriously, to prepare you for the coming judgment. And if you are someone who calls yourself a Christian but you do not share your faith, I need to tell you on the authority of God's word, because I love you, you are not ready to stand before God. I've been doing some research on what's happening uh, with the, what's happening culturally uh, among Christians. And one article I found that was of particular help was one done by the Barna Group. And the article was entitled, Sharing Faith is Increasingly Increasingly Optional to Christians. And I've got all the stats right here on the page in front of me, but I think what would be most helpful is to simply share this with you. There's an unhealthy trend of Christians mistakenly thinking in increasing number that the job of evangelization is a job for their church not a job for them personally to execute. And friends, this is dead wrong and it's a dangerous trend and I want the people of New Day to have no part in it. There's a growing trend of professing disciples of Jesus wrongly concluding that they don't have any personal responsibility to use their life to point others to Jesus when in fact, this is the sole purpose for us being here on the earth. And again, I bring this up because it's my job as your pastor to help prepare you for the coming judgment. And friend, you won't be ready If calling yourself a disciple of Jesus, you do nothing to point others to the salvation that's found only through him. So so real quick, five seconds, do a reflection. In 2023, in this past year, did you do anything to point anyone to Jesus? Did you talk to anybody about Jesus? Did you simply say the word Jesus in front of people that are unsaved? 
Did you hand out an invite card asking someone if they want to join you to church? Friends, do not be deceived. Many of you, I'm saddened to say it, but many of you, you're in the same shoes as the religious leaders. Right now, you're being a bad tenant because you're disobeying what the landlord, God the Father, has told you to do. Now, the good news is this. Here we are in the beginning of a new year. It's the time of the year where everyone's setting New Year's resolutions. Oh, this year I want to lose a couple pounds. You know, this year I'm going to be real faithful. This year, here's what I'm going to do professionally and privately. And we're making all these goals. Well, I think a really worthwhile spiritual goal to set would be this. Become a Christian. Become a tenant who's a good tenant for their landlord, God the Father. Give to the landlord the fruit that is due him in its season. I think this is a worthwhile New Year's resolution. I'm so happy that over the past year, we've had over 300 people come to faith in Jesus. And the vast majority of them, as is the case every year, were invited to church by some of you. So I'm so thankful that at least some of our people are using their life to point others to Jesus. But statistically, I know that many, perhaps statistically most, are sitting on the sidelines. In the words of Jesus, you're a lamp that's been put under a basket, not providing the light of the gospel to others because your light is hidden. Well, here in the beginning of the new year, let's commit to making that change. Let's commit to changing that reality for the good of the kingdom and the glory of God. And if you'd like to make that commitment, then I want to invite you here and now to make this commitment before God. Friends, would you pray with me? Would you bow your head right there on your couch, wherever you are? Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? And not out loud, but in your heart, maybe you'd say something along these lines to God. Say, Heavenly Father, I learned today that you had a purpose for the nation of Israel, which was to bring the good news of salvation to the rest of the world, but they refused to give you the fruit of obedience that you commanded from them. I realized today that I'm actually making the same mistake they made. So today, first and foremost, before I commit to anything, first and foremost, God, I repent. I understand that your purpose for my life is to bring your salvation to my friends and family and neighbors and co-workers. And today I commit to proving to you the genuineness of my faith by becoming active in sharing my faith. I pray that you would provide the opportunity And when it comes, I pray that you would help me to fear you and the coming judgment more than the person that I'll be sharing with. Because God, I often get this wrong. Oftentimes I fear them more than I fear you. And that's the very thing that keeps me quiet. God, help me to turn it around. I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do it in my own power. But God, I know with you, all things are possible. Father, help me to obey and then just trust you with the results. Empower me by your Holy Spirit to serve my purpose on the earth, giving you the fruit you require. I pray for your help, and I ask in the precious name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thanks, Mike. Oh, let's share our faith in 2024. Let's make that a New Year's resolution to spread the gospel week in and week out. And guess what? Your church can lead the way. New Day Church, we can do that because there's peace with God through Jesus. That's what you actually heard in the message today. You see, Jesus, he was sinless without sin except for your sin and mine. See, he took that upon himself. And when we try to earn God's approval with our righteousness, we have no righteousness. Jesus had no sin. We have no righteousness except for his righteousness. You see, you can't earn your way to God, but because of Jesus Christ and the penalty he was willing to pay that he didn't deserve, but because you and I had sinned, he'd said, I'll take it on me. We get to receive his righteousness. That's the right standing with God. 
It's the greatest gift that we could ever receive. And all we have to do is place our faith in that reality. In that Jesus died on a cross for you and for me. He didn't deserve it. Then he rose from the grave. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And for those of us that place our faith in that reality, we have the right standing that we never could have gotten on our own. It's the only righteousness that we can have, and it's that righteousness because of Jesus Christ. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. Do you want more New Day Church in your life? Well, please like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Want to take a next step in your faith? Our Church Center app is the best place to get more connected. So just download the free app on your app store today and be sure to choose New Day Church in Enfield, Connecticut. We are able to offer this sermon and all others like it only because of your faithful financial support. Thank you to all of you who so faithfully give each week. If you feel led to support our ministry financially, just go to our website at newdaychurch.cc forward slash give. Thank you in advance. May God richly bless you and we hope to see you again real soon.